reading this morning uh, begins Hebrews 11, starting at verse 8. The word of the Lord. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would afterward receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And then turning over to Hebrews chapter 13, starting at verse 10. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Father, we are grateful for your word this morning. We ask that you would speak to us from it. You would raise up your son, the Lord Jesus, in our estimation and in our eyes, and that we would rejoice in him and his salvation in greater measure. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So from Genesis 1.26, where it describes the creation of Adam and Eve in God's image, through to today, mankind, by design, has had to navigate between the now and the not yet. I say by design because God has clearly set up the world this way. He wants us to navigate that tension. Mankind had a future glory clearly set before him in the Sabbath day and in the creation of Eve. Those two things speak of a future glory. And so God has wanted us from time immemorial to navigate life now within the context of the hope of the not yet. That future eschatological hope that could be summed up as glory. Now, if we're honest, we would have to say that we have not navigated that balance very well. Adam reached impatiently for the not yet when he ate prematurely from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Others have forgotten or ignore completely the idea of any future hope. Religious types usually achieve this by placing the idea in a confession or a creed and assume confessing it is the same as living as if it is real. As Remy Braque has said, the imminent causes the transcendent to be forgotten. The earth eclipses heaven. Others collapse the now and the not yet together, while others so focus on the not yet that the now becomes irrelevant. The passage before us this morning was written to a community that for numerous reasons were in danger of abandoning Christ and in so doing abandoning the future hope that was set before them. Hebrews chapter 11 serves as an encouragement to persevere in the faith and not to draw back. So chapter 10 verse 39, right before the introduction to chapter 11 and the 
the, the list of the heroes of faith says this, we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. The contrast between the life of faith and faithlessness, life of drawing back or one persevering, believing to the saving of the soul. The Old Testament saints served as an encouragement to the first century Jewish Christians. And in particular, what we'll be looking at this morning is Abraham's hope for the city to come. That was an encouragement to those who were tempted to draw back. In other words, if we are to be faithful at this time in history and in this place, we need, like them, and like Abraham in particular, to testify with them, as it says in Hebrews 13, that here we have no continuing city. We have no enduring city. Now, before we look into detail, we need to get the context a little bit more within the book. Hebrews extols the greatness of Christ over and against those things which the first century Christians were, due to, uh, were tempted to replace him with. Jesus is greater than the angels in chapter 1. And therefore you should worship him. You should listen to him. Jesus is greater than Moses in chapter 3. Therefore you should listen to him. Jesus is greater than the Levitical priesthood. And he is greater than the Levitical sacrifices. Chapters 5 through 10. And so to depart from him would be a folly. To depart from Christ would be a folly. Now in the immediate context of chapter 11, we have various uh, verses that are tied together. In Hebrews 9.28, he says this, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. And contrary to the Levitical system. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. Sin has been dealt with when he came and offered himself as a perfect sacrifice. And to those who eagerly await him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. Now, as you read on in a few verses later, we find out that these first century Christians, these Jewish Christians, are not the only ones waiting. He says this, starting in verse 10, By that we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, Christ, this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting Till his enemies are made his footstool. Christ, who offered himself as a sacrifice for sin, rose from the dead, ascended to the right hand of the Father in fulfillment of Psalm 110.1 and sat down at that right hand. And since then, it says he has been waiting. These first century Jewish Christians are eagerly awaiting Jesus. For, to appear a second time for salvation. And the Jesus for whom they are waiting is himself waiting at the right hand of the Father for his enemies to be made his footstool. Clearly those two things are being related to one another. And in the context of the first century Jewish Christians waiting for Jesus who himself is waiting, Hebrews 11 comes along and tells us in verse 10, that Abraham, of chapter 11, he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. The waiting of Abraham is clearly connected to the waiting of the first century Jewish Christians who are waiting for the Jesus who himself is waiting. There's lots of waiting going on. For his enemies to be placed as footstool. And the Greek word behind all those three is exactly the same. The first one, 920, has an extra compound on it, and it's hence eagerly await. 
Clearly, there is a deliberate attempt in the book by the author to link Abraham's waiting with Jesus' waiting with a first century Jewish Christian's waiting, and hence, I would suggest, our own waiting in our lives now. The Jesus for whom the early Jewish Christians are waiting is himself waiting for his enemies to make his footstool. And so our waiting is for the glorious city promised through Scripture as the hope of the saints. And we are to wait in faith. Now what is the relationship between this, these waitings? What's the relationship between our waiting and Jesus' waiting at the right hand of the Father? This close connection suggests that the life of faith encouraged... In, Roman, in Romans, in Hebrews 11, the life of faith encouraged by all those faithful saints is part of the means by which God will be placing Jesus' enemies under his feet. So our faith is linked to the future glory we are told to look towards. Our faithful waiting is not passive. It's not a sit back, let's see what happens in God's hand. Our faithful waiting in God's hands is effectual for bringing his enemies under Jesus' feet and into building the city that we are looking forward to. Now that future hope is set out as a hope for a city particularly a city with foundations. He waited for a city which, whose foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now this is very striking. You should cast your mind back to Genesis. The story of Abraham starts at the end of chapter 11, goes through to Genesis 25. Okay? And not once in that story does it talk about Abraham and a city. And wanting a city or even trying to build a city or even looking forward to a city. The text is silent about Abraham's hope for a city. So why use that here? Why speak of Abraham in that way, in the Hebrews? Abraham's narrative comes on the back of two significant cities in Genesis. The first city to be built in the Bible was built by Cain. Cain is the first urban developer. After he killed Abel, God's judgment came upon him and he was told he was going to be a restless wanderer upon the earth. The earth would no longer give his strength to him. He was going to be a restless wanderer. Cain has a son. And what does he do? He builds a city. That is not someone sitting under the judgment of God. That is someone seeking to rebel against the judgment of God. The first city is an act of rebellion, not an act of obedience. You go on a few chapters, and just before we are introduced to Terah and his descendants and Abraham... We have the story of the Tower of Babel, the next city, where they say, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. This is a city uh, in, the, in the character of Cain's city. It's a city that is built on pride and the, the name of man. And we have that city just before Abraham is introduced. And of course, within the Abraham narrative, a city stands out. Sodom and Gomorrah. When Abraham and Lot's herdsmen start arguing because they have so many herds, the land can't deal with them living close together, Abraham says to Lot, you choose. And he lifts up his eyes and he sees this, the lush plain down in the valley leading towards Sodom, and he goes, I'm going there. He follows his eyes, he goes there, and he ends up in Sodom, which is then destroyed on account of its wickedness. 
So the narrative of Abraham, the way Moses has written the Abraham story in Genesis, the man of faith to whom God promised he would inherit the whole land, yet dwelt in tents all his life, is set against the narrative of city builders who, in their building of cities, were rebelling against God. And of course, therefore, all these cities are no more. They're gone. They had no foundations. They are, as Augustine rightly said, the city of man marked by pride. Of course, as the Old Testament unfolds, God speaks of a future glory. And he speaks of it in terms of a heavenly Jerusalem, a glorified Jerusalem, the city established by David, where God chose to place his name Isaiah 54 says of Jerusalem, O afflicted one, storm-tossed and not comforted, behold, I will set your stones in antimony and lay your foundations with sapphires. God promising in the future glory of the heavenly Jerusalem, of which the earthly Jerusalem is a type, says, I will build that city and I will build it, and I will build it with foundations. Foundations of precious stones. Isaiah 28, earlier in, obviously in Isaiah, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes in will not be in haste. Or as Paul quotes in Romans, Whoever believes will not be ashamed. Speaking of Christ as the foundation of this glorious city which God is building. Psalm 87, we could also go to. It's a psalm about Zion. It's a psalm about Jerusalem. But it has future elements intertwined with it. And it begins with what? His foundation is in the holy mountains. His foundation is in the holy mountains. And of Zion, it says in verse 5, This one and that one were born in her, and the Most High himself shall establish her, or in the Greek translation, the Most High himself has founded her, has given her foundations. The Jerusalem below serves as a type of the Jerusalem above, whose builder and maker is God, and it is a city with foundations. And then, in the culmination of This story, Revelation 21, what we find, we have the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. As we read on, you find that it's a city with foundations. And in that city, we find the sevenfold hope glorious hope that there will be no more sea that which opposes God there will be no more death there will be no more mourning there will be no more crying there will be no more pain there will be no more curse there will be no more night those things are gone in the city that has foundations so Hebrews is in setting the hope of Abraham as a hope for a city with foundations whose builder and maker is God, has read Genesis well in contrasting Abraham with the city builders of his time and incorporating the hope that was seen in the scriptures from beginning to end into here the way he describes Abraham living the life of faith. He was a man who looked forward to that city. Now what difference does this future orientation uh, make? Many deride Christians who are so heavenly minded there are no earthly good. That is the common way of saying it. Or as Ben mentioned in his uh, beginning uh, exhortation, the idea that religion is an opiate of the people, that hope for a future life which is perfect sort of comforts them in their 
in their distress now and therefore won't let them throw off the chains of their distress, won't let them liberate. This is a criticism of those who have this future hope. But the scripture does not deride that hope. It can be mistaken, it can be exercised badly, but it does not deride it. There is much fruit, according to Hebrews, in the lives of those who live with the future glory in their sights. There is much fruit. So Abraham, in verses 8 to 10 of Hebrews 11, it said, He obeyed God when he was called to go out of a place, okay, and he went not knowing where he was going. He says, He sojourned in the land of promise, as in a foreign country. He dwelt in tents. Why? For. He waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham's expectation and hope for the future city generated his obedience in the here and now. He got up. He left his home. He dwelt in a tent. Abraham understood that faithful living in the present is tied to and cannot be separated from One's expectation for the future. If God has promised a future hope, describes it a city with foundations, then how I live now, the decisions I make now, are not unrelated to that glorious future. He obeyed in the now because of his eager expectation of the not yet. He left his home. He left his father's house And all that he knew in the now because of his eager expectation of the not yet. He lived in tents, interceded for the righteous in Sodom, made love to an aging and barren wife, all in the now because of his eager expectation of the not yet. He had a future city, a glorious city with foundations in his sights. And it was that glorious vision, not only encouraged his obedience. It also gave meaning to the work that he did. Shakulul in his study, The Meaning of the City, says this, the glorious vision of the city must not make us forget the material city in which we are living. It must not detract us from the material work we have to do. On the contrary, it is there to make that work worthwhile. To be heavenly minded is to be of much earthly good in this understanding of a future hope. Abraham, as he longed for that future city and as he dwelt in tents and did all of those things, was a contributor to the building of that city which he hoped for in God's purposes. Verse 16, here is a glorious truth worth our time and meditation. Now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, therefore, because they desire a better heavenly country, therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. God is not ashamed to be called the God of those who desire that heavenly city and that heavenly country. He's not embarrassed to be seen out in public with them. Hopefully, we are not ashamed of those who live in that way. It would be awkward to be holier than God in relationship to those we approve of. Now, I lived in Jerusalem for three years. There's a lot of eschatological excitement in Jerusalem all the time because it feels like the end of the world is going to happen all the time. And you get people there who think they are integral to the end of the world, either Elijah or the two witnesses of Zechariah. I remember walking down uh, one of the streets with Anna. We walked past a man, if I remember rightly, with a fairly long straggly beard. Uh, with a sign proclaiming himself to be Elijah, coming before the imminent return of the Messiah. And Anna said to me, she says, he's going to get such a surprise when he gets to heaven and realizes he's not Elijah. 
And I said, yes, well, we're going to get such a surprise when we get to heaven and realize that he was. <laughs> Someone will be surprised. Now, I'm not encouraging people thinking they're Elijah. But I am saying that God is not ashamed to be called the God of those who long for that heavenly Jerusalem. He's not ashamed to be called their God. How we view other Christians, especially those who are different to us, different eschatology, maybe a different theology, and perhaps especially those who are only a little bit different to us, because those are the ones we probably poke the most for, for some unknown reason. How we view them reveals a lot about us and not much about them. If they are looking to in faith to Christ and desiring a heavenly city, a heavenly country, God is not ashamed of them and so you shouldn't be ashamed of them. One of the glorious visions of, the, of, of Jerusalem, the earthly Jerusalem in Psalm 48, which mirrors the heavenly Jerusalem, is that a city that is compound together. It's like one body. You can't see the joins. Okay, that's how it's going to be. We should start living like that now. In chapter 13, in 13 to 15, uh, the last practical application before we apply it a little bit more. Not having a continuing city here results in the following. Very clear. Willing to bear the same reproach as Christ. Christ bore his reproach and he bore it outside of the city gate. You couldn't put anyone to death within the walls of Jerusalem. So Jesus was crucified outside of the city. And it says we should go outside the city with him. Bear that reproach. Those who long for that heavenly city are willing to bear the same reproach as Christ. Goes on to say that praise and thanksgiving are the marks of our life in the here and now. They are sacrifices that are acceptable to God. Those who are living for the city to come are characterized by what comes out of their mouths, which reflects what's in their hearts. Complaining and grumbling are not the marks of a Christian eagerly looking forward to that future city that God is building. Praise and thanksgiving are the marks of a Christian eagerly looking for that future city. Verse 16, but do not forget to do good. And to share a Christian with that future orientation, that future hope, will be marked by generosity in regards to the good that he will do and the material wealth they possess. They will be marked by generosity. That glorious vision of the not yet generates freedom today to serve others and to be generous. And of course, if we allow earth to eclipse heaven, we are in danger of losing any freedom to serve and give because all you have is now and you will want to keep hold of it. Now, why is all this important for us in Moscow at this moment in time? Well, we have a congregation here that is made up of old-timers who have labored in the gospel in Christchurch and Moscow for a lifetime. And we have those who have arrived in the last 12 hours. <laughs> Literally. The U Hall is waiting to be unpacked. All the last 12 days, all the last 12 months, and everything in between. And it is a time of blessing. It is a time of growth in the church community, planting churches. Institutions started a generation ago are bursting at the seams. New families are beginning, new businesses are starting, old businesses are growing. There's blessing everywhere you look, it seems. And blessing is wonderful, but blessing is also dangerous. We can wax fat and kick. We must not let the horizon of our vision slip from the city to come to a city that has no foundations. 
under the weight of the blessing. Moscow is only the location of our labor in the gospel. It is not the locus of our hope and our labor. Whether you've been here your whole life or for a whole 12 hours, God has placed you here in the now to labor faithfully with your longing, hope, and expectation centered on that glorious city to come and building that glorious city to come through faith. We must not forget that. The vision of the glorious city to come, the city that has foundations, makes your work in the city here and now worthwhile. And your work here in this city, done by faith, with your affections and gaze on the future glory God has set before you in God's providence, will be part of God's building of that city to come. However, if our horizon slips and our goals begin and end on Moscow... All our work done here will begin and end here. It will become our work for our project. We'll end up trying to make it for a name for ourselves, just like Babel. And when that happens, God will come down and will put a spanner in the works. The glorious future upon which Abraham set his hope, described as a city with foundations whose builder and maker is God, is revealed in Revelation to be the new Jerusalem, adorned like a bride for her husband. And it is the natural end, the natural God-given end of mankind made in the image of God. When God made man in his image, he had that end in mind. That was his purpose. It's this end that was set before mankind in the garden, before sin ever entered the world. So the late British theologian John Webster said this, our nature, that's to be man, woman, made in the image of God, with that end in mind as part of our created nature, Our nature, therefore, presents itself to us as a vocation. And through deliberation and choice, we make these ends, that glorious vision, into our purposes. So why are you starting that business? Why are you expanding that institution why are you getting married why are you starting a family why are we planting churches how we answer those questions is really important what are the purposes for doing those things those things that we do Monday Tuesday Wednesday every day of the week in our lives now here in Moscow in the 21st century what are our purposes for doing those things Well, the purpose we should have in these decisions should be guided by the ends natural to us because we are made in the image of God. And that end is the glorious city with foundations. That is why we're doing it, because God is building that city. The one we are waiting for, and through faith, God will take those small acts that we do And make them part of that city. Abraham for this joy set before him was content to dwell in tents. Offer hospitality and run black ops to save his nephew. Many Old Testament saints for this joy set before them underwent trial and persecution. Some simply just blessed their children. Jesus for this joy set before him endured the cross. How then shall we live? The scriptures have set this joy before you. It is that future joy that makes your present labor, your present struggles, your present difficulties, your present blessings, your present success. All of it. Every last bit of it. It's worthwhile. This is our glorious hope. And so, we... As we live in Moscow, confess with joy that we have no continuing city here. 
And when we do that, we labor wholeheartedly in that same city with our hopes set on the glorious city to come, which God is building with foundations. Let's pray. Father, we rejoice in the salvation you have won for us in Christ. We rejoice that your purposes for the world that you created, your purposes for mankind whom you created in, whom you created in your image, that has been set forth before us in Scripture as a bride adorned for a husband descending from heaven. That purpose is sure and certain. And Father, we ask that you would keep us with our eyes lifted high onto that city. And in placing that hope for our eyes, we pray that we would labor faithfully, obediently, with great joy, and that we would see our work in your hands be used for your glorious purposes. And Father, we offer this prayer up to you in the words of the prayer that Jesus taught us. Paul calls the elders of the church at Corinth the stewards of the mysteries of God, 1 Corinthians 4, 1. Bear with me as we do a little uh, word study. The Greek word here, mysteria, i.e. mysteries, was translated into Latin as sacramentum, which is where we get the word sacrament from. The word sacramentum in Roman culture was the vow which a soldier would make as he devoted his life to serve in a particular legion. Taking this on board, we can see that both the outward sign of the vow and what the vow affected matter. The text I quoted at first tells us that ministers of God are to be stewards of these sacraments, these signs which seal the covenant oaths binding us to Christ. There are two ways in which a minister can fail in his task to steward these mysteries. The first way is to belittle the sign. The second way tries to bedazzle it. The first way treats the sign, as, the sign itself as a trinket that in itself is unimportant. The physical bread and wine can be tossed by the wayside. What really matters in this erroneous way of thinking is understanding that the real treasure is the pious feelings we had along the way. The other way is through unlawful ornamentation. This can be through additional liturgical flourishes or through taking the Lord's statement about this bread being his body and resting it to mean that some sort of magical switcheroo happens when the right spell is muttered over the elements. Stewards of the mysteries of God must help God's people learn to hold two things in tension. These physical signs aren't dispensable, but we must not dwell on them alone. Rather, through these signs, perceive Christ by faith and therefore our fellowship with the triune God. So come in faith and welcome to Jesus Christ. Uh, you, the charge is this, you've just eaten real bread and real wine, you'll soon fellowship with real brothers and sisters in Christ, and these are all seeds that we cast in the ground, seeds of faith, not to try to escape this world, but in faith and hope that this world will soon be redeemed and made glorious like Christ's own resurrected body has been made glorious. So now with open hearts, with open hands, receive the benediction of your Father. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and amen.